online. All right, let's just start. Uh, welcome, everybody. This is our second session, officially our first session for a virtual tour board. All the fellows who are on the meeting, welcome. Hope that your first 15 days was good. Uh, it's only going to get better. I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, not, not, sure not an easy time to start a fellowship, but I'm sure you're going to have a fantastic time. So today we are going to talk about uh, oral cavity cancer. There are three cases we discussed. I also present one, and uh, Jeff and Arno will present another one. Dr. Jeff Liu from uh, Fox Chase and Dr. Arno Buley from uh, UC Davis. Dr. Michael Moore is, uh, will be discussing most of the cases. If any of our attendings are online, please let us know and please feel free to uh, uh, make any comments or participate. All right. So let me start. All right, can you see this? Yeah. Okay. All right. So the first case is a 53 year old man, non smoker, that had noticed this uh, lesion on his tongue for about a month and came to see me. The only thing that he had in his past was uh, diabetes. No other past medical history. He worked as an engineer in a mechanical facility in New York City. Uh, when I examined him, you could see this kind of a superficial mucosal lesion. Actually, when you feel it, there is no depth to this. It's very, very superficial. And the rest of the exam is completely, absolutely normal. Uh, in order to give you a sense, I uh, measured it. It uh, measures exactly one centimeter. So, Mike, what would you recommend? You're on mute. I was telling everybody else to mute, so I had to follow. <laughs> uh, um, so yeah, so just seeing this patient, obviously, um, you know, it could be traumatic or inflammatory, but the concern is it's a malignancy. Uh, so I would, uh, after the completing the formal head and neck exam, which you to usually a punch biopsy, trying to get right at the edge of the uh, ulcer and the adjacent normal mucosa if possible. Exactly. And then so uh, you, you won't wait, you know, two weeks and let's, let's come back next to time to see me or anything like that. You just biopsy right there. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. All right. I think everybody agrees. And anybody else have any other comments regarding the technique? I agree with 100%. That's exactly what I do. Uh, punch biopsy, corner of the lesion. First visit, no, no deal with that here. All right, so I did biopsy that exactly as Mike said, and it came back as a squamous carcinoma model differentiated. Our pathologists are, pass, are uh, obsessive compulsive, so they even report the depth of invasion even in a punch biopsy. Um, and they commented it's at least four millimeter, but they said the tumor is transected at the base, obviously. Um, so when you get this, um, what would you do, uh, Mike, or let's see, Jeff? What's your routine for workup now? Um, definitely a CT neck. I think imaging of the neck is appropriate to um, augment your clinical examination for lymphadenopathy. You might look for any suspicious lymph nodes. Um, you know, for a T1 oral cavity lesion with a clinically N0 neck, I think be somewhere between either getting a PET or getting just a CT chest. I'm trying to be cheap these days because we spend a lot of money in healthcare and I lean a little bit more toward the CT of the chest, but um, I haven't picked over the ECOG Akron data on PET CT for early stage tongue cancer that may sort of inform this information. So I usually get a CT neck and chest if there's a clinically N0 neck um, in general, um, and then a sort of a T1 primary lesion. Sure. Arno, what would you do at uh, UC Davis? So if, if, if I'm concerned about anything on exam and clinic, I'll typically do an ultrasound uh, at the time of the biopsy. If they're clinic, truly clinically N0, I, I agree with Jeff. I do a CT neck and chest. I save a PET scan typically for advanced stage disease, either that's a locally advanced tumor or something where there's evidence of regional adenopathy, then I'll do a PET. All right. Uh um, I thought Don just uh, locked in. Don, what would you do in um, Miami for T1, you know, low risk patient or, or oral tongue? And let me show you the, the lesion if you didn't catch it. Yeah, I, uh, 
the the risk is interesting, but the four millimeter depth of invasion that you already have from just your punch biopsy, uh, I get. Okay. Uh, unless okay. unless. Us, we would do, I mean, because you'd want to know about, that's pretty lateral, but the other side of the neck is at least of some concern. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the, I mean, the neck needs to be addressed, whether you do it with yeah. central node biopsy or neck dissection, the, the, the neck know, needs to be addressed. So, okay. so I do um, that. Yeah, I, so in New York, we also get a lot of PET CT, but I completely agree with Arno and uh, Jeff that really the risk of finding anything outside the neck is extremely low. Um, Elshin, do you have any of the pre-treatment uh, images, or should we just go to the next one? Uh, uh, no, I do have the images, if you want. Okay, that's fine. While she's those yeah. up, can I ask you a quick question, and just uh, get yeah. your uh, input, Bob, I can in the of time. So, in the COVID era, do you change how you would do a biopsy for this? Do they have to be in some special environment, since yeah. you're breaching the mucosa? You know, yeah. So like a negative pressure room or anything like that? Yeah, yeah. So great question. Um, this is actually, you know, so it, it's doing a biopsy on a tongue, if not in the nasal pharynx, we don't consider it a super high risk. So we do recommend to have that, um, the, the provider is wear, wear N95 and a face shield and be careful. But as we know, as you know, blood is not infective. Mm -hmm. right? And the, you know, as long as you make the patient comfortable that they don't cough, um, we we don't consider it super high risk. But if I do a, I don't do a nasal pharynx biopsy in clinic anymore sort of without COVID patients. Like uh, but for these, I wear an N95, and then afterward, the, the room is, gets uh, terminally clean. So we, we call up, you know, people come up from the from the central office and the central you know, cleaning place in the cancer center, and they, they clean up the entire room after these. Babak, do you have to stop sharing your screen for Elson to take over? Yeah. All right. Okay, and I saw just, I uh, saw John de Almeida. Hey, John, how are you? Hey, Babak. So I assume you guys don't do a PET scan in Canada, do you, for the 51? You guys are smart with the money. No, we don't routinely do pets for oral cavity. Um, we yeah. have uh, specific indications in Ontario for pets, and oral cavity is not one of them. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. What are the All indications right, for pets? Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, you can go ahead. Let's hear other people's um, practices. All right. So, yeah, All right. What? You go ahead. You go ahead. You just need to. <laughs> All right. So he asked for it. Uh, we did. So here at NYU, especially when it's um, T1 disease, we do contrast enhanced dedicated neck uh, and the body PET as two separate classes. The reason being that you are looking at on the picture when we do neck CT only because of the dental artifact, which is very common, we can't really tell whether there's an oral cavity lesion or not. So I can argue we're not doing it for neck, but for lymph nodes, that's a different argument. So what we did in this case was dedicated neck CT and dedicated whole body uh, pets. All right, where's my screen? We can see your screen now. Okay, you can see it, right? Okay, yeah. um, but you are looking at two separate passes, dedicated neck, and dedicated whole body. We can do the whole body. It's completely negative. And when you look at the, apologize for the noise. Uh, and when you look at the uh, neck, now you're seeing a very FDG positive finding, which we could not really appreciate it on the uh, neck CT itself. But when I fuse the images, I think it's undeniably here. The SUV is 6.5. And PET CT with FDG telling us that this is the only lesion close to one centimeter. And when you look at the CT, now you can appreciate a little bit enhancing something here, but it's impossible to call prospectively. Although we try to uh, eliminate or minimize the dental hardware artifact using a syringe. So when you scroll through, 
basal tongue is hot, but this is physiological activity. And there are no lymph nodes. You can see mildly enlarged level two lymph nodes, but none reached either pathological enlargement criteria or increased APG uptake criteria. So PET is telling us this is T1 disease, N0, N0. Okay. And then the image that you saw, I've actually Richard, not had the, the original PET image. Left hand, so I just want to ask everybody else. I don't think we're, I don't think we're missing that. You're breaking up, uh, Don. Can you? Uh... I don't think that there's a chance. Don, can you hear me? You're breaking up. All right. So, in the interest of time, uh, Elshin, if I show you my screen. So, uh, basically, on the on our uh, workup, it it was. Um, T1 and 0. And okay. so T1 and 0. What would you do now, uh, Mike? Yeah, so I think it's, uh, yeah, I'd have a detailed discussion with the patient about not only the wide excision of the main primary with uh, intraoperative clear margin clearance, typically from the main specimen, um, and then you know, in my practice, if I biopsy it and it says at least four millimeters deep, I'm going to typically offer them a ipsilateral selective neck dissection. Um, I usually do one through, essentially one through uh, the upper four. Uh, I don't divide the omohyoid, but I pull out as much of that supraclavicular fat pad. Uh, not for necessarily any good reason other than you're there and it's a good time to clear it and you'd hate to lose below that. Um, you, know, you could argue to consider a sentinel node. I just, in my practice or something like that, I would err on the side of, uh, you know, formally clearing it. Sure. John, what about the uh, Toronto? What do you guys do? Uh, so, yeah, you know, we do a partial glossectomy um, with, uh, I agree with, uh, about the importance of doing uh, margins on the specimen. I, I, you know, there's good data about specimen margins versus uh, patient margins. And, yeah. um, you know, there's a nice paper out of the, uh, from the Pittsburgh group that, that shows the superiority of, uh, with local, improved local control when you take margins off the specimen as opposed to from the patient. And then in the N0 setting, um, you know, uh, um, we, we typically offer, a, again, for thicker tumors, and this looked like, at least on the image that you put up, uh, to be a thicker tumor, we'd probably offer a selective neck dissection uh, variable within the group. Uh, most of us will do at least one to three. Some would do one to four. And uh, um, one of the members of our group, Doug, uh, prefers to do sentinel node, but the, mo the, the majority of us just go straight to selective neck just for convenience issues mainly. Um, but uh, we are opening up the A10006 trial, trial with uh, Stephen Lai's trial, so we will be doing some sentinel nodes uh, on cases like this in the future. Okay, so everybody agrees that definitely the neck needs to be addressed. And uh, Arno, do you do, uh, just a quick poll, Arno, do you do sentinel node or you just go to selective and then Jeff? Can't hear you. You're still mute. I think you're doing oh, your audio oh, here. There we go. Me. Select okay. neck. Sorry. Selective neck. All right. Jeff? Selective neck, but we're interested in opening HN006 as well. Okay. So. And Don, do you guys do Pentolin or, or a selective neck? I do a selective neck for uh, just convenience and logistics. Frank would mm -hmm. do uh, Sentinel Node on occasion, not uniformly by any means. Sure. Okay. And well, we have Elchin here, and also, you know, I try to. Uh, any T, any T1 that I find, if there are T1, and it's like I do a central though. Uh, because Elgin has been so such a great addition to our team. And, you know, with the new machines, um, we have been very successful in finding this. So, Elgin, want to show us Thanks. the uh, the images? I'm going to stop sharing. Messages are sent. Thank you very much, Babak, for crossing uh, in our imaging systems. <laughs> so here is showing the primary. This is the injection site. So 
your injection is done by the surgeon, a done neck surgeon, because um, you want to make that. The American head and neck to reports. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Father, Sorry. please, if others, please uh, mute their phone. All right, go ahead. All right. So, because the injection needs some technical um, skills, you want to patient not swallow any so that it doesn't interfere with your uh, signal collection. And it's a painful uh, injection at the same time, and you want your head on exertion friends, you know, because you do this every day. We don't do it almost ever. So, it's fantastic, and it really, really depends on the surgeon's um, we just, I mean, I just imaged the patient. So injection site, hottest activity, and then you see that the sentinel node localized to this right level two, which by any means does not look any abnormal on the FDG pad SU is 2.4. When you measure it, it is uh, 1.4 centimeter, not even 1.5. And as you can see, as you go distally, this small amount of activity is in the esophagus, but it's far away from our uh, imaging site, so it does not interfere with any fine again single sentinel node. Sometimes we run into multiple, but the first one, that's where the imaging expertise comes into play. You need to follow this patient dynamically under the uh, camera to find the sentinel node and not end up calling multiple findings as secondary tier nodes. Okay, perfect. Okay. Uh, so if you let me... So thank you. In the interest of time, I'm just going to move quickly. All right. So I did that, and uh, um, I did a partial glossectomy uh, like anybody else. Uh, I, I like using a harmonic or a mega short because it just gives me a very nice, clean edge. And it's, you know, I don't use Bovi anymore. They also have less swelling afterwards. And our routine here uh, for myself and others uh, at our institution, we orient their specimen for pathologists ourselves, we actually take it down to pathology, show them, and we also, as John said, take the margins from the specimen. We don't do tumor bed margins anymore. Um, this was one sentinel node. It, I found it in like five minutes. It was very easy. Took it out, looked completely normal. I was ready to you know, go home. It was a Friday night, and I go down to pathology, and the, the, the first cut that we did, it was uh, positive. So we went back and did a completion next dissection. Uh, this is our pathology. It was a 1.5 centimeter module dissection claim, seven millimeter depth of invasion. All margins were clean. Uh, closest was eight millimeter. And the only node positive was that one uh, central node, which was at 1.9 centimeter. So, as I always say, um, you know, next dissection saves lives. And if you guys don't, for those of you who haven't seen this, uh, article from uh, Tata Memorial that is our best evidence that shows elective surgery results in elective neck dissection results in higher survival and higher disease free survival. Um, just a quick question. Would you guys do uh, any adjuvant treatment for this patient? T1 and 1. Actually T2 yes. because it was depth of invasion. Yes, I would. Um... And the whole point of doing the neck dissection is to identify high-risk cancers. Those that have metastasized to the neck, even with an N1 status, are um, by definition high risk. You know, I think we need to be very careful about when we talk about T1N1 management when they're oral pharynx P16 positive cancers, because we know sort of that profile looks different versus uh, oral cavity cancer. And I think every head and neck surgeon in their in um, has the experience of having what would seem like an early stage cancer and get burned by it. So. I would irradiate a T1N1. And that's the whole point, right? If you do find cancer in lymph yeah. nodes, that's the point. So I, I find this to be a high risk lesion compared to an N0 neck, and I would recommend adjuvant radiation. Yeah, I agree. Anybody else uh, would do anything differently? All right. Uh, well, I well, have well, a the... comment. Um, yeah. when, when you presented the case, did you say you palpated it and it felt very superficial, but then you biopsied it and found that it was at least four millimeters? Yeah, yeah, it was very, very superficial. There was actually no, yeah. you couldn't feel anything. It was very flat. So I want to point out that, um, you know, you're actually, you and I are exactly the same year from fellowship. So, you know, yeah. the, um, you know, you're good at this, right? You know about palpation. And when you get fooled and you do the punch by, I would say, what, this is four millimeters? Because it didn't feel like it. Um, I would, you know, you want to go to the operating room with every piece of information you can. And this is a case where I would take a good look at the biopsy, if you can, under the microscope. 
because um, the patterns of invasion, there's a, you know, um, the Genslayer Brandwine paper that looks at patterns of invasion of oral cancer between pushing borders versus these infiltrative islands. You right. might feel that it's superficial, but when you look at it, if it's, if they really called it four millimeters because of these invasive islands and you want to, when you do your resection, really think about that depth um, and how deep we're going to go for a resection. So just something to think about where, you know, this ended up being a seven millimeter depth tumor. And when you thought it was superficial, it has to do with the way it's been growing infiltratively and just be thoughtful about it when you do your surgery, which it looks like you did. Yeah. So just something to yeah. bring up. Absolutely. I, I agree with everything you said. And, you know, I usually go one and a half centimeter around that. Yeah, that's more that's too bad. Okay, so sure, I'm going to, uh, for those of you, please join the NRG 006. This is a very important clinical trial. And the Europeans have already done it, and we are behind, and we should get on this. I'm going to stop sharing, and in the interest of time, I'm going to have uh, Arno start your uh, his, uh, case. Arno, please go. Go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. All right, perfect. So this is a uh, lip cancer case. So this is an 82-year-old gentleman I saw a few months ago, <clears throat> four months hit four-month history of a gradually enlarging, painful lower lip ulcer. Uh, did have a history of AFib. He was anticoagulated on Eliquis, but otherwise pretty healthy. 60-pack-year uh, smoker, active smoker when I saw him, two drinks per day, in addition in terms of alcohol consumption. Now on exam, this thing was about three millimeters in depth. On palpation, it felt like it had some reasonable depth to it. I, would, I estimated about a centimeter as what I documented at the time. Both, it's hard to see on this picture, but both of the oral commissures are spared. There's a little bit more spared lower lip, probably two centimeters on the left when you stretched it out. And there was no adenopathy that I could appreciate on exam. So I thought I'd stop there and, and uh, ask people what the next steps for workup. Hey, who wants to chime in first? Uh, Let's ask Don. Don, what would you do? Uh, I would start with a CT uh, contrast. Um, I'd have a, you know, see what that looks like. Um, this is, I said, I think you said free of the mandible. I'm sorry, I'm driving, so I'm not getting. Oh, okay, no worries. No. Yeah. <laughs> free, free of the mandible. Yeah. Uh, well, free. Yeah. I, I, I would start with a CT neck. Uh, uh, have we biopsied this? Sorry. <laughs> so he actually, uh, sorry, just he came to me with an outside biopsy, which was squamous okay. cell carcinoma. Okay. I mean, I'd start with the CT neck again, similar to the last case. I think uh, PET scan is going to be a little misleading because you're going to have uh, probably inflammatory nodes in both sides of the neck, but clearly both sides of the neck are at risk. Uh, the contrasted CT is going to give you a nice look at, at what's there. Uh, ultimately, I think he doesn't escape with that scan. But anyway. yeah. All right. Anybody having, else? Yeah. If you're having any numbness uh, you, or if you can <laughs> feel something almost along the mental nerve, I would just an MRI. Uh, outside of that, though, I hear from you. Um, so, okay, go ahead, Arno. So, um, yeah, no numbness, uh, nothing to suggest. Clinic, I mean, it was tender, but nothing, I'd say, out of proportion with the exam that, that had me concerned about perineural uh, spread. So I uh, had ordered a CT scan. This is his image um, and some dental artifact, but you could see that it looks confined to the lower lip and then as we head into the neck there really were no enlarged lymph node that met criteria for concerning regional adenopathy in addition to the ct neck i did a ct of the chest and we did not order a pet scan so um, next thing i brought up was staging um, I just wanted to make a note just because lip is a little bit confusing in terms of it's really the boundary between mucosal disease and skin disease. 
and um, and the staging is really slightly different. You know, you know, we see these some patients who have really more kind of sun associated lip cancers that start on the skin or beyond or at the vermilion and then invade onto the mucosal surface. And then we see other, other cases where it starts on the mucosal surface and it'll invade out. But a lot of these more advanced or larger lip cancers will really invade both surfaces. And so the question is, how do you stage them? And so I just wanted to, to kind of compare the two staging systems. And it's really only a subtle difference, really. You know, each are divided by the two and the four centimeter criteria between one, two, and three. Depth of invasion matters for more, but for a mucosal lip cancer, which I think this was in a heavy tobacco use user, this thing really looked like it started on the mucosal surface. T3 is greater than 10 millimeters, whereas in a skin lesion, deep invasion is considered greater than six millimeters. So he, again, when I approximated on exam, was probably about uh, one centimeter. So he was right at the junction between a two, three, T2 and T3 because uh, I'd consider him more an oral cavity mucosal lesion. That's a great slide. Thank you for uh, putting it in the top. That's, that's fantastic. So it's a T2, kind of T3, right on the cusp, right on the border between the two and zero. Um, thoughts about treatment of the primary? Can you just put up the picture, Arno, so we can sort of like stare yeah. at it and pontificate? Absolutely. Okay. Well, let's ask John. John, what would you do? Who, me, Don, John? John, John or Don? Yeah. <laughs> if you're not driving, I don't want you to have a car crash. <laughs> you you, you picked up uh, Aura's habits very quickly. <laughs> um, I mean, I would treat this. I mean, I would recommend treating this surgically, uh, although you have to you have to entertain radiation in the conversation for lip, uh, particularly if it if you think it's uh, more sun exposed lip as opposed to oral cavity onto lip. Uh, not not what I would not what I would give him as first choice, but uh, so surgical treatment would be my my. Uh, my preference and, for this. And when you say surgical treatment, what would you do uh, for uh, you do a lip resection and then do you address the neck or you wash the neck? For something as large as this, I would address the neck. I would address both necks, I should say. Both necks. Okay. Um, John de Almeida, do you, uh, are you free? Can you make a comment? Yeah, so I mean, uh, I agree um, that uh, definitely our first line here is uh, is surgery. I guess in in patients who uh, who aren't candidates for surgery, one might consider radiation. Or, um, but uh, certainly I'd be offering this patient um, a wide local excision. It, to me, this looks like you know it's three quarters of the lip, and when you get a margin around this, we're looking at a near total sort of lower lip resection. Um, and for T3 lips, we typically offer uh, neck dissections as well, even in the N0 setting. So sure. um, I would be considering uh, sort of uh, uh, upper necks as well. Okay. Um, Jeff and uh, Mike, any other comments? Nothing to add, but I wanted to get into the subtext. I think uh, the folks here on the call are doing this sort of neck dissections with a little bit of reluctance for a clinically N0 neck rather, as opposed to enthusiasm. I think I want to point out that, um, you know, for oral tongue cancers, we have level one data, um, about 20 to 30% will be um, known positive uh, microscopically. But for lip cancers, even, the, even a, you know, a solid T2, I don't know if I routinely am performing neck dissections for those, just because the um, lymphatic spread of those cancers, like the behavior of this cancer is a little bit different than sort of like your standard oral cancer, even though you're usually, you could be, in this case, like you'd be applying the oral cavity um, T&M staging to it. Yeah. Okay. To to I'll add to you. Jeff to add to Jeff's point, um, sort of on the in the NCCN guidelines for for lip, I I, I think at T three that's when they're sort of uh, the re the recommendations made for upper for neck to section, unlike you know the vast majority of other oral cavity sites. So that's something important for the for the fellows on the call is that it's a little bit different in terms of the management um, from a guideline perspective and from what we technically typically tend to do. Yeah, those are excellent points. 
All right, Arno, continue. Yeah, so, so for in terms of the primary, I think, yeah, radiation, I think is important to bring up, particularly for lower lip as an alternative to surgery. Particularly, it's, I think it's, it's, it's recommended for really those really superficial but very broad lower lip lesions where the morbidity of surgery is higher. Definitive radiation I've seen work relatively well in those cases in terms of minimizing morbidity, but still offering a good curative solution. My preference is still for surgery, and that's what I offered him. He did have actually a reasonable amount of lip laterally. It's hard to see from the initial picture, but when you stretched the lip, there was actually a good cuff, cuff on either side. So I did a wide local excision. I was able to, to spare both commissures with a little bit of extra lip on that left side. So I thought I brought up neck really uh, broke out separately in terms of management of the neck because I think it's a good question. I think the points are all very valid. You know, lip is classified, mucosal lip is thought of as an oral cavity, but NCCN does break it out separately in terms of their management recommendations. And there's no depth of invasion consideration for neck, for elective neck like there is for the remainder of oral cavity tumors. And it really is, yeah, T1, T2, it's just treatment of the primary. And really they just, the, according to NCCN, recommend elective neck for T3. And again, he was right at the cusp. He was really at about a centimeter on palpation. Um, and so I had brought up with him the idea of doing it next. Now, the problem is it, it crosses midline, and so it's bilateral one through three. So a little bit of a more morbid situation than just a unilateral. So I actually offered him a sentinel lymph node for, for the lip, and I was interested to hear if anybody else has done lower lip sentinel node. The NCCN does say kind of in small text actually under the management recommendations that it's feasible and effective for lip cancers. Um, so it is included in the NCCN as an option, but vague and not really without any strict criteria on when to offer it. There's not a lot of specific data to lip and sentinel node. There's one series that I found um, from Finland that was published in Head and Neck a few years ago, 26 patients. It's, it's kind of, you know, more of a feasibility study than anything else. So, but, but we ended up doing a sentinel node. This was his uh, combined CT. Oh, trying to get it to run here. And um, it actually, actually, there's the massive signal at the lower lip. Surprisingly, I thought I'd see something in wow. level one, but there was actually very specific um, uptake really at this level four node, which correlated with a little bit of a rounded node on the left side on the CT scan. And so um, we did a sentinel node at the time of his resection. This pathology showed a 3.2 centimeter tumor. It was nine millimeters depth of invasion. Actually, I didn't list that on here. So it ended up being a T2 tumor, LVI, PNI negative, margins negative, three millimeters, a little bit close on one of the lateral margins. And the two sentinel nodes were both negative. Right. That reminds me of the old paper that you were talking about, you know, level four uh, metastasis from uh, oral cavity T1, T2, uh, yeah. which is another case here. But fantastic. How long you've been watching? What did you do for recon? So, yeah, recon was my next uh, slide if we had time. Looks like we have a few minutes left on this one. So, right. um, there's a close up picture kind of showing the residual lip on either side. Um, before I show what I did, maybe we'll hear from uh, some of our faculty. Absolutely. Okay. I guess we have three recon people at least. We have John, we have Don, and we have uh, Mike. All right. Who wants to go first? Yeah, I mean, I think you certainly could consider a carapanzic, um, you know, just bilateral advancement. You have a fair amount of uh, the, it looks like there's a fair amount of residual mucosal lip there on the inside. Um, you know, lip switch, I think works well. It's just they have to tolerate that period in between uh, where they have the pedicle remaining. Uh, I think you can get great results with that. Certainly if you have to resect much more than that, I certainly consider it. Um, but, um, and you can do that in the neck. If you do a neck, you sometimes ideally want to think ahead and preserve a facial artery on one side. Uh, maybe not absolutely necessary because you get backflow, but it certainly makes you feel better. Okay. I, I think, you know, because it, it, this is still considered a central uh, defect, I think Karapanzik would work well. And looks like he does have enough uh, laxity. Uh, left switch definitely works, but, you know, it looks like Arnold has done a great job and has preserved both, uh, both corners and, um, like, you know, the, um, and, and then, um, and a, what's that? And a granite, 
an advantage of the lip switch, though, uh, since it looks like the right side, you you really are relatively shorter over there. You could do a right-sided switch, and you're going to end up with a more symmetric upper and lower lip, yeah. even though it's not conducive for the patient. So just a thought. Yeah, yeah absolutely. In this case, it would be a true, uh, I think, what is your one of that? When, when you don't uh, redo the commissions, Abbe or the Eastland, one of those. Anyway. Uh, yeah, one John of those. John Dalmeda? Yeah. <laughs> what do you do? What would you recommend? Yeah, so, I, you know, I think we could do, uh, you know, I was thinking the defect uh, based on the original film, uh, image might be a little bit bigger, but you definitely could do something, I think, uh, local here. Um, I, I tend to use, uh, we tend to use uh, the Johansson step ladder for this defect. Uh, it uh -huh. hides nicely in, into the sort of the mental crease. Uh, and we like that. I, I find it gives a little bit less of this kind of whistle blowing um, uh, appearance that the, the care Pamzik, uh, provides. But I, I think both are very reasonable options uh, um, here. Sure. Okay. Arno, show off your hand. So, so I had planned, he wanted something simple. He didn't want anything staged kind of a country kind of rural guy. I had planned initially based on what I anticipated to be the defect to be, to do a care panzik. Um, and he, he, a little bit of a fish mouth here. I ended up just doing an advancement on both sides. It actually had quite a bit of laxity and it mm -hmm. seemed r relatively functional. So I kind of stopped there just with bilateral advancements sure. and he's actually done reasonably well. Yeah. Yeah. Lower lip is very forgiving and you yeah. know, obviously you did what the patient wanted and Get them off the table and get to it. Yeah, it's uh, you can do a lot of other things with it. Cool. So, right. just a couple po learning points if we have a, a minute or two. Yeah, go for it. But uh, yeah, I, I'm you know important to differentiate between mucosal lip cancers, which are considered oral cavity tumors, and then cutaneous or vermilion lip cancers, which are considered con cutaneous really em two embryologic surfaces, so they behave a little bit different, also different etiologies, to sun versus tobacco, um, and so a little bit of different behavior patterns. So important to make that distinction, both in terms of staging and also treatment. Um, primary radiotherapy, I think, is an important consideration for lower lip when they're especially broad superficial lesions with high morbidity of surgery. Upper lip is actually considered higher risk for for regional disease and lower lip, because and also the commissure as well, um, though both are important to consider um, regional occult nodal disease. And finally, sentinel lymph node. I think for particularly for central lesions where an elective neck would have to be a bilateral elective neck, I think sentinel node could potentially offer a way to minimize the morbidity of addressing the regional lymphatics. I agree. I think I never thought of doing central node for a lip, but I think you're doing an excellent point. That's yeah. Right. Overall, this was very educational for me. Thank you. Okay. Um, if I don't see any of the fellows asking any questions, so hopefully this is entertaining. Uh, Jeff's going to present the case, and uh, Mike's going to be discussing the case. Well, I might just need to unmute myself. And give me a thumbs up if you guys can see this and hear me. Yeah. Good. Okay, excellent. So um, this is a, the last oral cavity case for the evening. This is a 51-year-old male who presents with progressive enlargement of, a, of the right cheek, like sort of the outside of his face over the last six months. He's a pretty healthy guy with no significant history other than a sort of daily smoker for uh, one pack a day smoker for the last 30 years. And besides this, he's relatively asymptomatic. He's topping a normal diet without difficulty. He notes no oral pain, no discomfort except a feeling of fullness in the right side of his cheek and mouth, and he has no problems moving his face. So this is what it looked like uh, on the outside. Um, so he has a right-sided subtle fullness. Take, just take my word for it, there's a little subtle fullness here. Normal V2 function and normal facial nerve function. And on the intraoral examination, this is the right um, um, sort of buccal mucosa vestibule region. There's a firm mass of the right buccal mucosa. When you touch it, it's firm. Uh, there's no overlying ulceration or lesion, but if you look over here, you can see some um, red, some erythema, but it's not tender or, or uncomfortable um, in this area. And the mucosa on that side is sort of attached to it, so it doesn't slide over the mass at all. You can't really pinch it. It's like stuck to it, and the patient has no truth. So um, what would you do next? Oh, I guess it gets me calls. 
Babbitt, why, why don't you take, why don't you lead the way, Babbitt? What would you sure, do next? Sure, sure. I so you know I've had quite a few of these subnicosal lesions that um, that show up and they are usually slow growing and you know that was an excellent description of these and I I I hope that everybody paid attention when you said the mucosa over it doesn't move but you can move it over kind of the skin. So this is a definition of a submucosal mass. They are usually a minor salivary gland tumor. They could be benign, but there is a chance that they could be malignant. So I would start with a biopsy, and I usually do a punch biopsy. So you do a punch biopsy. Okay. Um, anybody else have any comments on the next step? But I make sure that my punch biopsy is deep, not just the mucosa. I know that I'm aiming for the submucosa. Anybody else? Don? Oh, no, I know you've got to go pretty soon. Do you want to comment? I can't hear you, Arno. You're muted again. Thank you. Um, I agree with the punch biopsy, Mike. Needle biopsies, are, you know, it'd be tempting here in terms of not violating the mucosal surface. But with salivary gland tumors, which we suspect this is, it's difficult to make a definitive diagnosis on an FNA. And often they can just, often at least our pathologists will just tell us salivary neoplasm, which isn't that helpful in terms of gauging the degree of, of malignant, low-grade, high-grade, which you'd really want before you went in for surgical resection. So I agree, punch biopsy. Okay. I would, would say, I know it's probably obvious to the group, but you would actually go through the area of the mucosa that's fixed to it, because you would want it to be an area you're gonna be resecting at the time of surgery, so you don't seed it in the soft tissue and the tract. So going directly in an area, if you ever have to do an incisional biopsy of anything, essentially plan your surgery such that it wouldn't seed anything that would be difficult to clean up later. Okay. I would, I would just add, uh, and again, I don't think it applies to this patient, but in looking at the picture, you've got this bluish discoloration over this lesion, and you can get some vascular malformations that are very firm depending on whether they're flebolus and things like that. So um, I, I would just want to make sure everybody is at least thinking about that. If your exam clearly has this as a solid mass, then a biopsy right away without imaging is fine. But that bluish discoloration makes me think about imaging before a biopsy. It's a great point. Thank you. It's a great point. So um, we'll start with the biopsy. A biopsy, as I say, a biopsy is performed. Um, and he had two, two passes at two different times. Uh, both of them were positive for malignant cells. It was sort of carcinoma favoring a uh, malignant, um, sorry, carcinoma favoring a salivary gland primary. And you can see a series of uh, immunostains below to give you some of the details, but it's definitely a carcinoma of some type favoring salivary. So uh, John, what would you do next? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, part of the question here is uh, how to, I mean, the patient obviously needs a full staging workup, so they need imaging of the head and neck and probably something to stage the chest. Um, I, I, I probably wouldn't be comfortable alone with this needle biopsy, although it gives you sufficient information to probably act on. I guess one of the questions is, is this a low grade versus a high grade salivary gland neoplasm? Because in the low grade setting, you, you may be considering just a resection of the primary, whereas in the high grade setting, you may be thinking of managing the neck nodes as well. And that, and that doesn't seem to be answered quite yet. This could be a PLGA based on the commentary there, asynic cell, but it could be something sort of more aggressive. So I, I, I would proceed to a, a punch biopsy at, the, at this point if your FNA hasn't yielded a, a definitive diagnosis. Okay. I'm going to show I, the I image completely again. agree. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Bobby. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree. I, I think that those are excellent points because as we learn more great in salivary tumors, it's very important in determining. You know, this is probably a T2. I don't think it's a T3. So it doesn't, it's not high risk for normal metastasis based on size, but if the high grade, I would seriously consider addressing the neck node. Yeah. So let me show you the imaging to sort of feed into the thought process. Um, I didn't point it out, but basically there was no clinical signs of lymphadenopathy at the time of examination. So I think everyone, I think everyone can see my mouse pointer. So um, the lesion is here located in the right of buccal mucosa space. Um, this is sort of lower down on the more inferior side. Here's the ascending ramus of the mandible. And it's a very nicely well circumscribed uh, lesion of the uh, right buccal space. It is mobile on clinical examination um, and, and doesn't appear to be, um, you know, it, it, it's mobile. And so here's uh, the 
CAT scan images and the superior aspect abuts sort of the um, lateral aspect of the um, maxilla, the bony portion of the maxilla. Uh, this is, these are coronal images again. So here it is uh, in the um, buccal space on the right side. And here there's some separation here from the um, maxilla. And here's one more view. And um, you know, this is thought, you know, this is just probably mucosal changes. It, it, this is, this seemed to be separated with the, the bone here appeared to be very normal on the, on the skin. I know it's a little loss of volume averaging here. Um, and here is the sagittal images that um, you can see here. And uh, there's no signs of uh, cervical lymphadenopathy or suspicious lymph nodes on TT scan. And just for completion's sake, you know, there, here's the MRI. So on the left here, I know I thought I'd, you know, just max it out yeah. right now. The left-hand side is uh, axial cuts. Um, you can see here, uh, the lesion here are one weighted sequences. Um, and on the coronal, coronal imaging here, you can see again, the location and its relationship to the surrounding tissue and structures and the signaling. Um, the, one of these was a T2, but I lost it. Um, but this is the T1 with contrast here on the lower left, where you can see it does enhance with contrast um, and, and lights up. And so this is, this is the CT and MRI imaging. Um, over the, um, so based on that finding, I would be curious what your thoughts are about the lesion. Um, I did not do a punch biopsy, but those are some excellent thoughts about to try to maximize your pathological diagnosis um, pre-surgically. Um, I'll jump to Mike if you want to open up with what your thoughts are about the lesion and then how you want to approach it. Yeah, I think it's um, obviously the resection of the primary, the, some of the big questions are, you know, um, a, approach to surgery. Um, you know, do you do it just transoral? Obviously, small buccal lesions, you can consider that. One like this, I would consider a combined transoral and transcervical because I, I probably would err on the side of performing a lymphadenectomy because it may be beneficial here to perform a buccal reconstruction potentially with a um, you know, thin uh, fascio cutaneous flap. And I, I like to be able to, you know, it looks like the drainage of the parotid gland is going to be taken out by it. So would probably at least consider um, a parotidectomy approach to excess the distal facial nerves, see if any of them can be preserved that are right over the tumor, uh, get to a neck dissection, and then also gives you good access to that deep and posterior margin, which is the big challenge when you're going transorally. Obviously, your clinical exam is going to really guide you well on the approach, but that would just be my initial knee jerk based on the image. Um, okay. Don? And I think you're muted, Don. Although if you're driving, I can skip you for a little bit. No, I, I'm, I'm in my driveway. Uh, okay. And the, uh, the uh, you know, I would approach this as much based on what I was thinking for the reconstruction. And uh, I agree with Mike, this, Again, just looking at the pictures on my phone, uh, I would be thinking about a, a, a forearm uh, probably. And if I'm thinking about a forearm, then I'm doing a neck and, and doing a transoral, transcervical approach. Uh, if this is a small mucosal defect that you're anticipating and it is well circumscribed laterally, a transoral approach only, and depending on what you're thinking for recon, I, I is an option, but it it's not what I would probably be initially thinking. And, and the only other point on the imaging is I thought I saw an MR image that had some asymmetric changes in the ipsilateral maxillary alveolar ridge uh, adjacent to the tumor, uh, distinct yeah. from the contralateral side. Uh, and if that's and that image there on the CT is also somewhat concerning, but. Clearly, that's a physical exam issue, and if that's abutting but mobile away from it, it's an important point for the fellows that you got to look at that very carefully and be sure that you don't ignore it. But again, if you can move away from the, you can move the lesion. That's probably not related. So, just a just an aside. Yeah, yeah it's a big tumor, and um, you know, it's uh, if you look at the T two. It's not super. Do you have a T2 uh, sequence? Um, I'm trying to see. One of these was T2 when I picked it out, but I don't yeah, know. I think that's, uh, but, you know, it doesn't have the, the sequence of a benign, which is a pleomorphic. So this is malignant, and but it has very nice uh, interface with the normal tissue, and that's important. It's probably not an adenosine. I 
you would, I've, I've become very reliant on MRI for any calibre. The MRI is uh, much superior for the soft tissue tumors and also has some characteristics that helps you. Every time I see a bad tissue interface, it turned out to be an adenocystic. And when they are like this, that makes me think that this is probably not an adenocystic. Uh, probably not an adenocarcinoma, but uh, it's not a benign tumor either. So I agree with what Don and John said. Uh, I think this is uh, big enough that you probably need a radio forearm. But on the other hand, you know, your, your skin margin basically is going to be all fat, but that's going to be okay. In these tumors, if they're not super high malignant, you can accept the narrow margin surgery and save the facial defect. Okay, great. Any other comments, uh, Arno or anybody? Jeff, I, th I think, you know, um, if this was uh, indeed, a, if this was a polymorphous low-grade adenocarcinoma, um, we don't really go for super wide margins around these, nor do I think yeah. you need to. Um, so that, that's another reason why a definitive histologic diagnosis is helpful, because if this was a PLGA, I for sure would be doing this transorally. I, yeah. I, I would not be going for wide margins, and I'd pull in some in this location, buccal fat actually swings out quite nicely. This patient, if it was a PLGA, we'd be arguing away from doing radiation. So mm -hmm. we're not worried about, um, about sort of loss of uh, um, creation of trismus with a poor wound healing bed and, and so on. So I, I, I'd be moving away from a transcervical approach if, if I knew this was something low grade, like a polymorphous low grade. Whereas if it was a little bit of a higher grade lesion, I'd probably be doing the neck and, and putting skin to reconstruct the lining uh, with the presumption that uh, they may need adjuvant radiation. Yeah, I agree. Thank Thanks, those are all some great comments. Um, you know, this is I think a very strong commentary that there's really no substitute for clinical examination. Um, and in this case, you know, everyone's thinking potentially the needing for a wider resection because if it's a fixed lesion, this is, it was really strange. It was like a super mobile lesion, not fixed to the maxilla. You can move it back and forth within the cheek. Um, all of it that suggested that it was a more lower grade and, and um, pushing borders rather than deeply infiltrated borders. So um, I elected to proceed with a, a transoral approach. So I don't have a lot of pictures from the operating room, but I basically took an ellipse of skin um, uh, uh, from around the, um, in the buccal space, in the, in the buccal uh, cheek mucosa. Um, I went wide enough where as soon as I made the incision, we were able to sort of get onto the external capsule and that then it was not um, stuck to it in that in that area and we were able to basically excise it and then slowly by pushing on the cheek we were able to sort of chase the capsule and then deliver it out and completely intact so you can see here the lesion here is uh, what four centimeters in size um, but it came out a lot easier than you would have thought it, you know you made the incision you sort of use a freer and start to mobilize something glucosa and then it just started to give and then we sort of just kept going to see how, where it went and then it, the whole thing was able to come out and it is a single specimen which was really nice and so because I was able to preserve the mucosa, um, I was able to close it primarily after mobilizing it and then put in a pen row just because there was some, um, you know, a soft tissue defect, you know, in that space. Um, and he did well postoperatively. From a, a pathology standpoint, very interesting. This ended up being a mammalog analog secretory carcinoma that was 3.5 centimeters in size. No LVI, no perineural invasion. I sent some of the mucosa at, at that location to look for any deeper elements that might, I like got any submucosal elements that I may have been um, transected, but um, all the mucosa was benign on frozen. Um, and so this ended up being a uh, mammillary analog secretory carcinoma. Um, we'll talk about the uh, margins in just a second. All of you made some great comments about tolerating closer margins. So I kind of interested in what you have to say about closer margins. Um, uh, so we, this uh, lesions uh, tumor was sent out for next generation sequencing. There is a, a fusion gene, which is the uh, NTREC um, ETV6 uh, fusion gene, which is uh, pathognomonic for this disease. And just a short, um, well, I have a little thing later, but the, the short answer is that this ended up being a mammillary analog secretory carcinoma. So I can go back to the pathology. So. It's close. I mean, I'm not going to pretend like it wasn't close. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, it, it's not like there was, it's like when you're doing a product, uh, it's not like a prodectomy where you can grab a bunch of extra tissue and sort of keep a cuff of tissue all around it. You're just in the buccal fat and you just be transecting fat and sort of indiscriminately to try to get some tissue. And as soon, of course, as you pull it, it's just going to shear away because I think the way this tumor grew is kind of a pushing, um, 
uh, pushing um, margin. So yeah, even if you are taking some fat, the fat usually doesn't survive the the fixing yeah, process. Yeah, it just falls so off. It, it's still going to be you know. If you're not get close margin here, you're going to get a close margin there. It doesn't matter. Uh, so I'm curious about much, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry about so, it. This, but I remember these were considered an adenocarcinoma. Now, mammary, now with the genetic testing, we don't think of them as terrible adenocarcinomas, but uh, it's still kind of considered an adenocarcinoma. It's a good sized tumor, it's a T2 tumor, 3.5 centimeters. I think clinically it's behaving well, but um, I, if you are not recommending RT, I would watch this patient very closely. Okay. Other comments on adjuvant therapy for this patient with this margin status? Anybody really want to do radiation? I don't think anybody wants to do radiation, here, but <laughs> that's a, it's a pretty big tumor and yeah. on the one hand. And the morbidity of radiation here is going to be high, so that's a bad combination. So I think it's a real dilemma. This is your classic real dilemma. Uh, yeah, we discussed it in our tumor board, and the recommendation was for no radiation, but with some reasonable debate, as, as you can imagine. So just a quick couple comments. Uh, mammalian and like secretory carcinoma is actually a new entity. You get a lot of new stuff in medicine in the neck, so it's a new lesion that was sort of um, first identified in 2010. As Bhavik pointed out, he used to be sort of like low-grade adenocarcinoma NOS, and then they sort of been now um, categorized into this group of mammary, mammary analog secretory carcinoma. Um, it's, it's a low-grade, usually salivary tumor, and it's very similar to these breast cancers that are secretory carcinoma, which is their, hence their name, the mammary analog. Um, they are, there's not that many cases reported, about 90 cases out there. It's really hard to sort of make any definitive statements about, you know, where this is going to go, but it is considered on the low-grade spectrum. Um, and then, like I pointed out, there is a, a translocation of the NTREC and ETB6 gene fusions, which is pathognomonic for diagnosing this, this uh, tumor. So after they had the preliminary diagnosis, um, while they were working it up of mammary analog, they sent it out for next-gen sequencing, which confirmed the cancer. And there's a nice like review in laryngoscope about um, these uh, cancers in 2014 in, in laryngoscope. So that's all I have for this case. Um, any final comments? Yeah, Thank you for uh, presenting. It's a super interesting case. I would say I commend you on uh, ordering the next generation testing. We are doing more and more for salivary gland. We have noticed that salivary gland tumor, even with super experienced pathologists, uh, genetic testing can give you a lot of surprises, much more than squam and others. So we are also doing the same. And especially in tumors that are weird and you know, non your bread and butter, you know, or uh, I agree with that, and I think in this case, the clinical behavior kind of uh, is in line with the genetic makeup. Um, so hopefully your patient does okay. I, I agree with you. I probably would not raise it again. I personally would have gotten a little bit more mucosa, but I guess I'm a little bit more heavy-handed and probably would have done the uh, radio forum. <laughs> but I don't think you did anything, you know, I don't think what you did was not. Uh, Perfect. Thank you. Any other comments? This will be the last case. Mike, I'd what would you uh, would you do a uh, radio forum for these uh, Bokum It's all tough. I mean, we've had a lot of these where you, I think many of us, I think when you go in there, you think you're going to need it. And then in reality, it's such a well behaved thing clinically that you end up saving more than you think you can save. So it certainly seems like that was the case here. And it's probably just an interrupt call. I would have prepared for it, but Fortunately, it sounds like it wasn't necessary. The other thing that I sometimes do is I just uh, don't close it, and I just put a stick a, a piece of alloderm, and the alloderm falls off in about a few days, and it's maybe closed it on the knee set and granulates. Um, that's sometimes, you know, something to do. I don't know if it causes more scarring or less scarring, but uh, I, don't, I don't try to mobilize that mucosa to cut it, to, to bring it together that much. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I had, I had a fair amount of experience taking buccal mucosa grafts from my urological colleagues when they're yeah. doing um, the urethral patches. And um, I found it's amazing how much buccal mucosa you can take closed primarily. And then like a couple weeks later, they're almost back to normal in terms of their function. So um, that, that gave me some um, 
you know, comfort with like the amount of mucosa I had planned to take. But I think the point is well taken. You don't want to leave like not be able to close it or have the patient have fixed trismus because you're overzealous about um, trying to close it primarily. Especially if they need radiation afterwards, it's a completely different ballgame. You know, if they are not radiated, you can get away with anything. John, what about Tron? Uh, you guys do a lot of buccal uh, mucosa for uh, those uh, fancy uh, learning to reconstruction that Ralph used to do. Um, yeah, yeah, but you're talking about buccal mucosal grafts, uh, Babak? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. You can take a lot of buccal mucosa, but I think the point is of whether or not they're going to be radiated is an important one because if you're taking a lot of buccal mucosa and then you're radiating the patient, then that's when that you set them up for, for trismus. And then the other important thing is how deep you're going with the resection. So, um, you know, it, it looked like in the specimen that, that Jeff showed, it looked like the buccal, the amount of buccal mucosa that was taken was, was quite small. Um, so, you know, I think, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, avoiding doing anything major is, is nice. Uh, I don't know if you, we, we talked about this before, but we've started using a, a thinner uh, flap than the, the forearm, something called the tapas flap from the posterior skin, the temporary artery posterior skin flap, which is a free flap based on the perforator from the superficial temporal artery and vein. And you wrap it around the, you take it from the post mastoid skin and, and it's a very thin and pliable uh, skin flap with a short pedicle, but you can do micro easily to the facial artery and vein. It's nice for buckle, um, for thin buckle tumors. And uh, Right, and you close the, prime, the donor side primarily? Yeah, yeah, you can, or you can put a, a full thickness skin graft back oh. there, uh, uh, but you can't, you usually close it primarily. Gives them a little bit of a uh, set back here, but you close it primarily. Cool. All right. Well, maybe next time you should have, uh, show us a video of how you do it. Okay. It's uh, 8.03. Thank you so much for joining us. That was great. I, I learned quite a few things. Uh, we look forward to having you in about two weeks for our next session. Let us know. Please give us feedback. Uh, thank you for all the panels. Michael Moore, Dr. Michael Moore from Indiana, Jeffrey Liu from uh, Fox Chase, Dr. Don B from uh, University of Miami. Dr. John Dalmeida from the University of Toronto and Dr. Arnold Bewley from UC Davis. Have a great weekend. Uh, have a great uh, evening and a great weekend ahead. I'll see you in two weeks. Okay. Thanks, guys. Right. Thanks, guys.